Hey there, y'all. We're going to be getting started here in just a few minutes. I want to get a live stream going into the Facebook group so that the folks over in Artwork Living can catch it as well. So hang tight for just a little minute and we will dive right on in. So while that stream is getting started, just a little quick housekeeping here. So to make sure you have the best viewing experience possible, make sure that you have all other streaming devices turned off. So if you've got Dropbox, Google Drive, Netflix, any of those things running, turn them off now. If you've got 14 million tabs open, which I generally do, I'm really bad about that, um, go on and shut those down as well. You want to have on open as few things that are pulling on your internet bandwidth as possible to make sure that you've got the max um, available bandwidth. So um, the other thing that I want to go over really quickly is how you can ask questions. So if you're joining here live, this won't work if you're watching the replay, right down here, if you're in Zoom, right down here at the bottom, if you scroll along on a desktop, you'll see an idea bubble with three dots in the center. Click on that and it will open the chat roll and then you'll be able to participate in the, um, the dialogue here because I don't like to just be a talking head. So if you've got questions that you wanna ask, Feel free to type them into that chat roll. Another little piece of housekeeping about that is when you open that chat roll, and I want everybody to open their chat roll right now. If you're on mobile, it could be either at the top, the bottom, or the side somewhere. So you wanna find where that chat roll is. When you open it up, you'll see a blue button that says all panelists. Zoom does that by default. But I want y'all to be able to see everybody else's questions while we're on live. So click that blue button and select all panelists and attendees. That way, everybody's going to be able to see any of the questions and comments that you have. So first order of business is to make sure that you've got the chat roll open and that you've got that blue button picked to or set to all panelists and attendees. And if you have a question that you know you wanna ask, you can ask that in the chat roll and I'm gonna scroll back through it to um, try to make sure I catch all of those. At the end, I'm gonna leave plenty of time for, for Q&A on today's session. Um, also, if it's something that is right pertinent to what I'm talking about at the time, I'll stop and answer it right then. So I want this to be participatory. You don't have to just sit there and listen and take notes. And a quick reminder that if you signed up and registered through Zoom, then uh, you will get the replay links in your email. If you're joining live via the Artwork Living Free Facebook group, the video will live in there afterwards and you can catch the replay in there. If you've registered and you stay on the whole time, I have a little Cersei for you. So. Those who've already registered and popped their email address into the system, I have uh, an ebook that I'm going to be sending out after the broadcast this afternoon that goes over how to jumpstart your the inner game of being a painter, that inner game versus just the outer game. I've talked a lot about that over the last week. So just want to make sure really quickly here that I've got that Facebook group live and yes there we go people are on in there too so what we're going to be talking about today is a topic that is near and dear to my heart I feel like I'm on a mission to eliminate eradicate get rid of that myth of the starving starving artist and replace it with the realization that there is no reason for artists not to thrive in the 21st century. So we're gonna be covering three big topics today, three main things. I wanna make sure that I get through here. And the first is the top five beliefs that hold artists back. 
and how to reframe those so that you can thrive. It's not enough to know what holds people back. You've got to switch it around, reframe it so that it doesn't hold you back anymore. Then we're going to talk about how building an online platform can help you reach more people and have more impact with your art. So one of the, the things that I hear most often from people is that they have no clue how to reach their audience. Well, the online platform is the way to do that. And if you don't have a website today, if you haven't started a website, you don't have an online platform, and the website's just part of that, for sharing your art, then you're missing the chance to create a thriving studio practice because you can't do it without that online platform, not anymore. And you're missing the chance to create a business that's independent of the traditional career art gatekeepers. So let's look first at those false beliefs. And I'm going to invite y'all to type any extra false beliefs that you come up with that I don't cover into the chat roll or into the comments. Because we'll look at some of those. I'm going to pick one from the audience that's not on my list and we'll practice reframing that as well. So the first big elephant in the room is that old idea that if you go into art, if you make art, if you're a creative, if you choose that as your career path, you'll never make any money. You'll starve. You will have to have support from everybody else and be dependent on everyone else to live. Anybody else get told that when they told their parents that they were going into art? I did. I majored in art. And even though my mother was an artist and my grandmothers were practicing artists and everybody in my family, well, maybe half and half, half of my family are artists, I still got the, you're not going to be able to make a living doing that. What are you going to do? That was from my dad, the scientist. Well, the truth is, that's all I've ever done. And it has been possible to have that thriving career for a long time. But it's even easier at this point. Most of the fears, the, the limiting beliefs that people have around having a thriving career, around making art as a living, have to do with that starving artist myth. And those are things like a, a parallel kind of corollary here, the idea that um, you can't make any money from selling art. Yeah, Denise has is, is, is typed in one into the, the chat roll here. My principal, when I was in first grade, told me not to study art. Yeah, um, and a lot of people, including my mother, never, mom never tried to actually sell her work. She really wanted to, but she couldn't figure out how to do it. In the way that artists were trained in the time period she was in college, in the 40s and 50s, they didn't really teach people how to make a career as a painter. They taught people how to go into graphic design or interior design because those were more suitable avenues for people who were creatives, even if that wasn't where your passion was. And when I was in college, they still didn't teach artists how to make a living as an artist. Part of it was it was still so difficult. So back in those days, a long time ago, pre-internet, um, there really were gatekeepers. We had dealers on one hand and museum curators on the other and art critics as the third tri of the triumvirate of gatekeepers to the art community. And unless you bypassed, unless you passed through and got permission from one of those three gatekeepers, you couldn't create a sustainable career in art. It just simply wasn't possible. But guess what? That has changed dramatically because at this point, those gatekeepers are not holding us back. So if we take that limiting belief around thriving and starving as an artist and not being able to make any money because there was just this limited pool of resources to tap into, limited channels to distribute your work, What's happened now, the big game changer now, is the internet. Because with the advent of the internet, 
those old systems were disrupted. They don't, they don't hold us back anymore. You can still participate in them. And in fact, if you want to participate in them, you have to go online. So it's become a system that's way more open. You can create your own online platform and access your audience directly without permission from those gatekeepers. It's a wonderful, marvelous world. You can get right in front of your ideal collector and you can make an offer that appeals to them that is unique to the relationship you build with them that can sustain both you and your business so that you can be a thriving artist. So we don't have to starve any longer. We actually can make money from making art. Another one that I hear a lot is that um, if you are selling art, if you're making art and selling it, then you're selling out. That's really kind of a, a flip on the starving artist myth that the only way that you can make money, if you're making money and selling it, you must not be that good an artist. You must be painting for the art market. Well, the reframe on that one is the truth is that doesn't work. When people paint to the market, the artwork lacks an emotional connection. I talked about this a little bit earlier this week, but the artwork lacks an emotional connection. So painting to the market doesn't work. It never has worked. You can't paint to what you think the market is, is heading towards. So you can't go and decide, well, everybody is selling balloon paintings this season. I'm going to make balloon paintings and I'll make a million dollars. Because if balloons are not something that floats your boat, your viewers and collectors are going to be able to pick up on that and those paintings won't sell. So painting to the art market, painting towards a perceived market just doesn't work. Never has, never will. So selling your work is not selling out because if you are actually selling your work, it means that you've built a relationship with your audience and you have made a connection, an emotional connection to them through that artwork. And they are exchanging money for the artwork. That's not bad. We all deserve to make a living. One of the figures that I saw um, not too long ago about the current market in art um, kind of blew me away. The online art sales industry. Now, I'm not talking about the global art market. I'm talking about just sales online. In, two years ago, in 2017, the global value of the art market was $5.4 billion with a B. There's money out there. Doesn't mean you need to paint to the money, but it means there are people out there willing to buy art online. So there's a market for it. You just have to figure out how to get into it. Third big, big fear that I hear from people is the fear of failure. They're afraid of a number of things, of failing in a number of different ways. They're afraid that if they put their work out there, nobody will want it. They're afraid that if they put their work out there, that people will say it's priced too high or it's priced too low. They're afraid that if they put the work out there, that somebody will make fun of them. That fear of failure, that fear of looking ridiculous is an old human condition and it's not unique just to the art market. But the reframe on that one is, if you don't attempt anything, you'll never succeed. Failure is actually a good thing. The only way that you move forward, that you get out of your comfort zone and take a step towards being a thriving artist is if you fail forward. So you need to fail a lot of times. Um, this is a story my students have heard probably so many times they're bored by it, but 
Um, I am a big horse fanatic, some of you may know. So when I was learning how to ride years and years ago, I learned to ride in England and we learned under a very traditional system. And we were told that we were not gonna become good riders until we got over our fear of falling off and we fell off 10 times. We turned that into a game as kids, and we actually kind of took it too far. We would kind of throw ourselves off and go, does that count? Am I there yet? So you're not going to succeed as an artist until you've fallen flat on your face at least 10 times. It's gonna happen. But you just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and say, what did I learn from that experience that I can take towards the next one? You don't need to be afraid of failing because failing actually improves both your art, your marketing, and your creativity. All of those th three things will get locked up if you lock yourself into that fear of failure. The fourth, the fourth big, huge one is that, and I think I lost, flip the count around there. This is almost the fifth one, but the fourth big huge one is when people worry that they're too old, that there's not enough time left to become successful and thriving in their art practice. That's just not true. I call BS on that. Let's think about that in a little bit different way. It could potentially have been true 20, 25 years ago, when the art market had that very narrow gateway for all of us to get through. Only a certain number of people could get through at one time, and it tended to favor the young because they could be more flexible, they could move to New York, they could have um, access more easily to those channels. Well, that's just not true anymore. It is entirely possible for an artist to start their career at what we used to think of as the age of retirement. So one of the most successful artists that I knew in the state that I used to live in, and that still live in sometimes, in South Carolina, was a, a good friend of mine who didn't really start her art career until she was 65. She had spent the years previous to that in a full-time career raising her children by herself because her husband had passed away and working for the city, creating art programs. When she hit retirement, she rented a studio space, started working full time in the studio, pretty much 8.30 to four every day, creating that consistent body of work. And while she didn't create her own online platform, she found a dealer who did. And she became the highest selling artist in that gallery. You don't have to wait and you don't have to kiss your dream goodbye because of where you are in life. The, the flip side to that is thinking you're too young. Age does not have anything to do with it anymore. What creates that successful artist? is somebody who has put together the magic threesome in a balance that creates flow. They have created that artwork, that strong, successful body of work, the compelling artwork that pulls people in, that has that emotional connection. They have the creative mindset, the inner game of painting down, so that they've shifted their belief system around what's possible. And they've realized that they can control through their online platforms access to their engaged community and audience. When you bring those three things together, you can decide where you want to go with it no matter what age and stage you're at. The other thing, another belief that I've heard from people, I'm going to call this one number five, is that. They can't be successful as an artist because they live in a small town in the middle of fill in the blank. So why is that a false belief now? 
because with the advent of the internet, you can live in a very small town. And certainly when I began my online business, I don't think anybody would have called Columbia, South Carolina, as much as I love it, would have called it an enormously thriving art scene. It's got a good art scene, but not one that on its own could support full-time art careers from a whole lot of people. Ah, but what changed it is I had access to the internet so that I could reach out into a global marketplace and develop client relationships with people in the UK, in France, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and across the US. So being in a certain geographic place does not limit you to the starving artist mindset. You too can thrive. There is no limitation that you can come up with that is not unlocked by the environment that we're in right now. So I want to pull one in from, let's see, I'm going to pull one in. Oh, here's one from Gretchen. Yes, this is one I didn't mention. And I do want to talk about that one, Gretchen. Gretchen says, I've heard people say, you don't have the formal art education and resume to afford you the respect of starting at a later time in life. And that is one that just makes me kind of pull my hair out. Um, there's a broader version of that that's just as damaging. If you don't have an MFA or BFA, substitute whatever the art degree that they're talking about, if you don't have that degree, you don't have the credentials to have a successful career in art. Not true. Most of the galleries do not care what your degree is. That is not a ticket anymore to the successful art career. Truth is, it never has been. It hasn't been for decades a ticket to the gallery scene or to the thriving art scene. The degree is completely separate from that. There are so many different ways to become educated in art. And it's another aspect of the internet that has taken down barriers. You can now find a mentor on the other side of the country and fly to that person for a weekend to study with them. You can find a mentor on the other side of the world and sign up for one of their online courses. So again, geographic location doesn't have anything to do with it. You can develop your education, your professional development any way you want to. And I hear that one all the time, that people feel like their own professional development that they've created for themselves, their own version of an MFA doesn't count. And that's just not true what galleries are looking for, what collectors are looking for is good art, good compelling art that connects with an audience. That's it. They don't really care about your degree and where it came from. So banish that one right now. That's one that people like to repeat, but it doesn't have any basis in truth. I have a student that um, I taught a couple of years ago online, and I'm not sure if she's on right now or not, but I talked to her at the end of the course because she was trying to figure out what to do next. She wanted to develop her professional career, and she was thinking about going back and getting an MFA. That is most definitely an option if you want to teach at the college or university level, but it is not required to get into a gallery at all. And people should know that it costs about $100,000 to get that degree. So you have to have a pretty good idea and roadmap in mind for how you're going to recoup that investment if that's the direction you want to go. There are all sorts of other ways to get that professional development. Yes, you need a compelling body of work, but you do not have to have a university or college degree or an art school degree to get there. So that's one that I think holds people back way, way too often. Elaine says, um, nobody's too old. I agree with that. But for some of us, the extreme health issues stop us. 
that's true there. And I can't speak to anybody's individual situation, but one of the things that can help when you feel like help situations are getting in the way is you can reframe how you make art and do it a different way. So look at if there's a different path you can take in the making process itself that allows you more freedom with whatever limitations you may have. So there, there are ways around things, but you do have to get a little bit more creative sometimes when there are those kind of things in, your, in the roadmap or in the road that get in, in the way and form a block. So let's eliminate these that we've talked about right, right up front because the answer to all of them is creating an online platform. So you can go from starving to thriving. Starving is not true anymore. People are making billions of dollars, not one individual perhaps, but there is a multi-billion dollar market out there that we can all tap into. It doesn't matter what genre you're in. It doesn't matter what medium you work with. It doesn't matter where you live. There's a market an audience that you can connect with. So I'm gonna come back to that one a little bit later. Next, if you make money, you're selling out. Simply not true. You're developing a relationship with your viewers, with your collectors that goes beyond making money. Some people have no interest in making money from their art. And I'm gonna come back to that one again in a second too, because I wanna talk about some of the different success paths that are out there as an artist to making an impact. Your impact might be through the number of collectors you have. It might be through the students that you enlighten. It might be through the audiences that you reach through museum and nonprofit exhibition spaces. But there's an avenue for each and every person. You're not limited anymore at all. Then there's that fear of failure, fear that people won't show up, fear that there's not an audience out there for you, and that the work is simply not good enough. A lot of people think that there's a definite there after which you can start selling or marketing your work or having an impact. There's no there, there. We're all growing. So we're all at different stages. No two people are at the exact same stage in developing their compelling artwork. But whatever stage you are at, if you share your work, you can find an audience who's receptive to it, not only receptive, but needs it. Then there's the fear that you're either too young or too old. How does an online platform address those issues? Here's the way it works. There are three parts to an online platform. This is what I mean by online platform. There are three parts to it. There's a website, then there is your social media hub, and then there's your email list. I love the rule of threes in composition, and also in business. So when you're looking at creating your online platform so that you can reach an audience, you need to have a website. You need to have a social media account, a hub is what I call it. And then you need to have an email list, not your, your address book in Gmail, but an actual email list that people have opted into. Those three components create a really strong platform that you own that people can't take away from you. You don't want to be dependent on one single source. So what does that platform allow you to do? It allows you to reach out and connect with your ideal collectors. You may live, remember, on the other side of the world, across the country, or right next door, but you won't know until you start building that relationship with them, until you start connecting and developing that ongoing relationship. One of the myths um, that 
I hear and I see a lot of times. Um, I've seen lots of artists fall victim to this, uh, that they think if they build a website that they'll automatically get followers and they'll art automatically sell their paintings, that all they need to market their art online to have an impact is to build a website. And so they run out there, they pay thousands of dollars for somebody to create a website for them. They get all their artwork up there and then they're crickets. Well, that's because they've only put in the first column in that strong online platform. You can't stand securely on one leg. You've heard, all heard the saying, um, build it and they'll come. It's not true. They're not going to come unless they know you exist and you send an invitation. You've got to reach out and make a connection. The, and this has been true for a long time. It predates actually online. You know, people used to think that if they made the art, the audience would find them some magical way and they would be discovered. Well, you get discovered by showing up on a regular basis. So it's not going to happen just by creating a website, but you do need that website. Here's how a website helps you and why it is absolutely critical, no matter how you wanna make an impact in the world with your art. Websites are how galleries, dealers, and curators find you. When you go to talk to a gallery about being part of their stable of artists, one of the first questions they'll ask you is, do you have a website? The expectation is that you do. They may not even find you until you have that. People do search online, but if you don't have a website and an audience, you're probably not gonna get picked up by that gallery anymore or in the first place. So you need the website in order to connect with those different channels out there. So the website can help you be found by galleries and dealers. It can help you be found by individual collectors. It can help you be found by groups like big publishing houses that license artwork for prints and reproductions. All of those things, all of those avenues are opened up to you when you have that website for people to come view your artwork but you have to do something to get them there. They're not just gonna magically find you on Google. So Google can find a whole lot of things, but if you haven't done the legwork, it's not gonna find you. So the second column of that successful online platform is a social media hub. Social media is how you move people over from Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or Twitter to your website. So think of social media as the big moving stream or river. And your website is off to the side. It's a little side tributary. The way that you get traffic to that website is by standing in the river and diverting some of that flow over to your website. So your activity online is how you can organically begin to move people over to your website. So right now on my own platform, the biggest driver of traffic to my website, in fact, some of you may have found me that way, is Pinterest. It's not Facebook and it's not Instagram. It's Pinterest because of the way that we've set up our Pinterest account and have been using it. It drives a lot of traffic to the website. So just having them arrive there is not quite enough because people can arrive at a website and then bounce off. The third leg, the third column on that online platform is your email list. And what I mean by that, is a list of subscribers of people who've opted in 
to your email list and you're using an email service provider to message them. It is illegal in almost every country I know of to simply broadcast an email to your address book unless people have opted in. So please don't do that. You can't just add somebody, for example, to your email list without permission because it has all sorts of privacy ramifications and it's against the law. So you need to develop an, a permission-based email list. There are lots of services out there that can do that. We're gonna talk about it more tomorrow in the second part of this video series. But your email list is crucial. Your email list is the lifeline where you're gonna talk back and forth to your new audience. It is your telephone line, in essence, to your future collectors, to the people who are gonna be impacted by your art. So you need to start building it right away. You know how they say that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is right now? Same with an email list. And everybody starts small. So don't get intimidated when you hear somebody go, I have 20,000 people on my email list. You don't know how long it took them to get there. So start where you are with the people you know and invite them to your email list. So those three columns, those three legs again, are your website, your social media platform, and don't try to do them all, pick one and stick with it for a while, and your email list. Together, they give you a system I want to key, on that, key in on that word again, a system for reaching your ideal customer and client. Most people, when they're trying to market their work, are not using a system. And that makes it really hard to produce consistent results. So you really do need to become systematic. And there's, going back to limiting beliefs, there's another myth out there that artists can't be organized and they are not techy and they can't um, conform to systems. And that's simply not true. Some of the most efficient people I know online are artists. It just means that you need to find a system that works for you. And everybody has a little bit different system, but you need a system and you need to be consistent. So establishing that online platform means that there's a way for all of those different gates out there to come to you. All of those different channels, ways that you can become a thriving artist to find you. Because there are multiple success paths. There's not just one single success path. When I finished school, there were really pretty much two. You could teach at college level, or you could go to New York and try to make it on the gallery scene. Dog eat dog world. So that there were really only two directions that you could go. That's not true anymore. So I want y'all to think about some of the different opportunities and success paths that are out there that you can tap into with an online platform. One is the obvious one of selling your work online. And you can sell your work online on your website. You can sell your work online on a big platform like Etsy or Saatchi. You can sell your work online through directly through Instagram and Facebook with the plugins that are out there now and available. So selling your work online is an option. You can sell your workshops online. You can teach online. You can tap into the nonprofit realm online. So if you have a website, you can use that as a foundation to build up a network of nonprofit support and exhibitions that will let you have an impact on people without having to sell your work. So selling is not the only option out there. If you get into that nonprofit track 
and start writing grant proposals and tapping into even some of the funding sources out there like Kickstarter, then you can create a track that does not require that you sell your work, but you fund it through project grants and um, funding from nonprofits, foundations, and through those crowdsourcing sites, crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter and GoFundMe. Big shout out to Kirsten who got her Kickstarter funded last week. I'm still so excited about that. So I have a student right now who has funded one of her big projects for the year, a series of paintings that she's doing, um, going to be doing on the, the horses on Chincoteague in Virginia. Um, she got that funded through the Puffin Foundation, a grant proposal that she wrote, and through writing and executing a successful Kickstarter campaign. So there are options out there other than selling on your website, but you need to have that platform in order for that to become efficient. Then there are a thing, all sorts of other avenues as well. Anybody have any other ideas of ways that you can make a living as an artist via an online platform? Type that into the chat roll. Um, Kath is, says, do messenger messages count towards email list? That's a different kind of email list. So I'll, I'll cover that tomorrow. Um, it does. It's just a different platform for hosting. It's a little bit different. So um, do art shows help to find collectors? That's a good one, um, Sandra. Sandra has asked that on Facebook. Thank you, Carson, for popping that one in. Um, I have some mixed feelings about art shows. Art shows actually, I think, really help lead more towards that nonprofit museum route than they do towards individual collectors on the internet. It can flesh out your resume, but it is not necessarily going to immediately lead to a collector list. So I would be very careful of how many competitions and shows you enter. That is in its own little art world. You know, the, the truth is there are multiple art worlds, and that's why there are multiple success paths. And you get to pick which ones you participate in, which ones are aligned with you. And the art show competition world is very much based on the idea that people will pay to play. So organizations create and start a competition and exhibition with the understanding they're going to make money from it. They don't do it if it's not making money. That's why they charge a fee for you to enter. That's to defer the expenses. And I have nothing against them doing that, but realize that when you enter a lot of these competitions, that they are, that, that is their business model for making money, whether it's a, a nonprofit arts council or your local guild or a big competition. And there are a lot of those out there. This is what they're using to fund their organization, to keep things going. If you want to go down that route, do it for a short while, but it is not a long-term game plan. And if you do it, the only way it's really going to drive towards the direction of collectors is if you have that online platform and you disseminate the fact that you've got that exhibition coming up and you won that prize, and you, in essence, begin to build that into part of your communication plan. But it's not gonna happen because the organization's gonna feature you and give you lots of PR. That free PR and exposure carrot that we get dangled in front of our eyeballs all the time is a, a total facade. I had another word, but I'm not gonna use it. It is not not really legitimate. 
So when you get asked to donate your artwork to a fundraiser and in return, you're going to get lots and lots of free exposure and you'll, you'll discover all sorts of new collectors say thank you, no thank you, because that's not how that works. It won't happen that way. You might occasionally hit the jackpot and find a collector that way, but that is, again, a fundraising model that has been developed and furthered by fundraising institutions, and it's not to benefit us. It's to benefit them. So be really careful with that. Carol says... Um, to do what Kirsten did and combine with environmental issues dear to our hearts, provide artwork for projects. Absolutely. So I think if you want to have an impact on a cause that's near and dear to your heart, partnering with a nonprofit. Now I have another student, Leslie, who's done that. And she has taken that auction fundraiser idea to a level that I think I haven't really seen any of my other students do. And she creates it as a partnership between herself and some of those other fundraising agencies. Like she's working with the um, public television station where she lives in a fundraiser that I think the gala is Friday, but she only donates to, I think, three organizations a year, and that's certainly the limit I have. And she uses that as a PR opportunity. So she knows that she is losing the value of that painting. It might be a $900 painting, and she's not going to get the money for that because the organization's going to get the money. But she's just got $900 of free advertising because they gave her the chance to push it. Not because she's relying on them to do the advertising for her, but because she's using it as an opportunity to share that story with her audience, to share it with her community, to share it with her online followers. So that's where that can really, really work. Another success path that works with that, um, and I've done this one before, pick an a cause that's dear to your heart, and it might be an environmental one. It might be, say, a national park that you care very deeply about. Create a series of artwork and give a percentage of the sales to the foundation that supports that cause. And that creates a direct partnership. Any of those kind of things, you want it to be equal to equal, not them bestowing some gate to you because if somebody comes up and says i'm going to open a gate for you 99.99 percent of the time they really aren't they're going to take advantage of you so it's absolutely possible to do that yeah lynn i totally agree with you lynn says i have never gotten collectors by donating artwork so that donation route is not one of the success paths that i would talk about if you're going to to donate an artwork it needs to not be to, a, to just every auction that comes along. It needs to be that you're creating a partnership relationship with that cause. And that's perfectly fine to do. But don't just donate an artwork for them to sell off at half of the price or a fourth of the price of the value of the actual artwork. That doesn't benefit anybody. You, in particular, will not benefit from that. So. Um, Yes, Gretchen, I agree with that totally. Gretchen Worth says, I was told by a professional serious artist that entering an, um, into an auction for an organization's benefit can do a lot of harm if they auction your painting below what they normally sell for. And that absolutely will do harm. So when you get into that kind of arrangement, you need to have a really clear understanding with them that there is a base price that the art has to sell for so it doesn't hurt the art market. Galleries and dealers don't like nonprofit auctions and it's really obvious why they don't because it undermines the sales in the galleries. Lots of people who are cheap wait for those auctions to come around to go pick up artwork by their favorite artist at reduced prices. It's a fire sale. Don't participate in fire sales. 
Instead, set the terms. Become empowered. You actually do have the power to control those terms and decide what that base price is. Make it above the, the fire sale price. Keep it at what the actual value of the work is if you're gonna donate. But pick and choose your causes. You do not have to participate in all of them at all. As Kent says over on the Facebook group, I donate to one organization and set a minimum. Yeah, I'm guessing Kent Burris that it's the Ronald McDonald House that you donate to. Kent does amazing work around the world with the Ronald McDonald House, and I am in awe, my friend, of what you accomplish with that. And Kent also is a phenomenal painter in his own right. So yeah, be really, really careful with those donations. So if you are in the Facebook group, I'm going to grab my phone here so I can see all the comments because I see comments coming in there and Facebook rolls things down so that I can't see the whole thing. So I am going to pop it open. Oops, wrong one. Pop it open here so that I can see what the questions are that are coming in over there in the group. Hang tight for just a second. I should have opened this up before we got started and I did not do that. So I have to mute it so y'all won't hear me talking over myself there. There we go. Now I can see them, excellent. So. Um, I'm going to take just a couple more questions, but I want to make sure that um, we get to point number three here, and then I'll take some more questions. So, yeah, Carson says, um, oh, that Bob over on the Facebook group. I've got it pulled up, Carson, so I can see it, I think. Oh, nope, it's not showing me all of them here either. So thank you, Carson, for popping them in if I'm missing them. Um, Bob Nolf says, I'm fine with the making art part, but the two old feelings apply to learning about all the ins and outs of Instagram, Facebook, tweeting, webpage, blogging, and all the rest. I hear you, but it's not as complicated as all of that. Um, all of that can seem overwhelming. I think that is a really good thing to think about there. Um, how many of y'all feel like you are just not tech savvy enough to create an online platform. Type yes into the comments. If you just get overwhelmed at the whole idea of social media marketing, of having a website, of having an email list, and of thinking that it has to be super complicated and super techy newsflash it doesn't it doesn't um there are some really simple solutions out there that take away the need to know things like coding um about the ins and outs of the details of the social media platforms the thing to remember is that you need to have a platform there are solutions like FASO that allow you to create a website and an email list on a real secure platform. It's still basically WordPress, but they've got the templates. They've got it all figured out. So all you have to do is upload your artwork. And Bob, I know you post a lot on Facebook on your own. You're already doing 99.99% .99 of the stuff you need to do. You're just not gearing it towards those potential collectors with intention. So the main thing you would need to shift there is having an intention behind what you're posting, that you're thinking about what direction you're sending people to. Because I know I see your work online a lot. So if you get a platform, you choose something like FASO that's so user-friendly, you can set up a website almost overnight and they have great tech support. I'm not an affiliate, so I'm not getting anything from that 
at least not yet. I am going to become an affiliate because I keep sending people there. But it is only for artists. It's an artist-based, artist-run, artist platform. And it's individual websites. And it includes the um, email service provider. So it's a pretty simple solution. And I know a bunch of y'all have it. Yeah, it's, Carol, it's F-A-S-O, FASO. Yes, and Leslie Miller says, even Leslie can create a website. Ha, ha, ha. Leslie sure can. Um, so, Bob, don't let that be a limitation. Um, social media-wise, you're already doing it. You're on Facebook. And that would be the platform you probably would want to use. So you want to use the platform you're comfortable with. You don't need to go learn a whole new one. You just need to learn a little bit more narrow way to use it and to show up with intention. So the most important thing about a platform is to use it and use it consistently. So just having it doesn't do you any good. You've got to show up on a consistent basis in order for it to be effective in audience building which is that next step that we're going to be talking about tomorrow. So yes, somebody's asking, is FASO international? It sure is. And as Susan Holderman says, or Susan McFadden says, FASO's blog page can be linked to your Facebook page. Absolutely it can. And to your Instagram. So, um, and somebody else is asking about a second Facebook page. We're going to talk about all of the, those components that help you build audiences tomorrow. So don't, it, you know, don't worry about it. If you've got a question on there that we're not going to get to today, that's more about the audience building component. I'll come back to that tomorrow, but I'm going to scroll back through and get to some of that. Blogs. Catherine says blogs with a big question mark. Yes, blogs. And yes, emails. But I think what, throws people off and holds them back about writing a blog post and about writing emails, which is all part of platform creation, is that they think it has to be this long, in-depth newsletter. I hate newsletters. And I don't, in fact, I tell my students, don't send newsletters. Newsletters are dead. Um, you know, the old newsletter that sort of was an imitation of the snail mail newsletter that had a big image at the top and three columns with little, little images on the side for you to click on and lots of links and social media links and multiple stories about your activities from the last month. And you would write this newsletter once a month and spend all weekend writing this long newsletter. That doesn't work anymore, and it hasn't for at least five years. And the reason it doesn't work is that most email platforms won't let it through their filters. So how many of y'all have Gmail? Lots of you, I bet. And I can go into my system and look, and Gmail is the single biggest platform that people have their email address on. Um, Gmail has filters that are trying to keep spam out of your inbox. And one of the things they filter for are newsletters. So they're looking for emails that have lots and lots of images and lots and lots of links and lots and lots of multiple colors in there. That's not the kind of email that's actually going to get there, land in your, your subscriber's email inbox and have results. They don't work. Think about what you do with physical newsletters that end up in your mailbox. How many of them do you actually read cover to cover? Probably not that many of them. An awful lot of them end up in the circular file. Well, that's why Gmail does that. They filter them out because they trigger the spam filters. The other reason they don't work is that most people because they make them so big and so complicated, only mail them once a month. Well, think about how many emails we get in our email inbox. By the time a month has gone by, your subscriber has forgotten 
who you are, why they subscribe, and what it is that you do, because you're not staying in touch with them long enough. Third reason that newsletters don't work is that newsletters tend to be written all about us as the artist. They're me, 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 I, 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 I. I had a show at the blah, 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 blah. I have an exhibit coming up at the blah, 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 blah. I went to China and had lots of fun on my trip, blah, 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 blah. That's not gonna really create that emotional connection that you need with your email subscribers. Think back to another kind of newsletter you get. It also tends to go into that circular file. You know, those Christmas letters that you get from long lost third cousins that you haven't talked to in 10 years that outline their 13 year old soccer accomplishments and the 13 year old you've never met. That is about the same thing as writing a newsletter that's all about your accomplishments. It's all about your subscriber. It's not about you. So you need to be writing letters to a friend, not sending newsletters. Write short emails. They don't have to be long. Write short blog posts. They don't have to be long. We've got art. They're pretty pictures. We got the stuff to share. But it doesn't have to be an essay. And it doesn't have to take a whole weekend to put it together. So that's my rant on newsletters. Um, yeah, Lynn says, when I had FASO, I sent out my first newsletter to 10 subscribers and not one went through because she had five or six images in there. Yeah, the, having lots of images in there will trigger the spam filter. And that the number of images you can get away with has actually gone down to a real tiny little number. So I wouldn't put more than one or two images in there. So it really, really can be difficult. I want everybody to remember that you have to start somewhere with an email list and it's okay if you've got five subscribers or you've got one or you've got zero. You have an audience, you just haven't moved them yet to that email list. Every one of you has an audience. I'm gonna go back to Bob's comment because again, I know how much Bob posts and shares about his art and I know how many friends he has online because I see him active in so many art groups. That's an audience. You have friends and followers online. You just need to get the ones who are interested in your art over to your email list. And it starts small. I had, I think, 34 to start with, maybe in 37. And it was because I invited my friends and family to join my email list on MailChimp. And it was tiny for a very long time. I remember how excited I got the first time I hit 100 and then I hit 500 and then I hit a thousand and I thought I was hot stuff. So there are points all along that way. And there's actually a lot of power in a small email list because the people who are on your email list when it's small are hyper engaged. So I have a big email list right now. I have to clean it out periodically because there are people who are not engaged at all and I have to take them off so that the people who are engaged will actually get the emails. So don't worry about how many you have or how many you don't have. There are ways to get them there, and we're gonna talk about that a whole lot more tomorrow. Um, yeah, Andrea says the me, me, me stuff is hard for me to get over and the tech stuff. Um, I, the, the thing to do is not to brag about yourself. It's to write about your art and to tell your story and to engage on an emotional level. I think for everybody, when they first start out and are using a platform to connect with their audience, you can feel awkward when you're doing it and like you're imposing on your viewers, but you're really not. They signed up for it. But if you treat them like a new friend or a colleague, then it's not gonna be icky. So the question to ask yourself as you write those emails is would I send this to my best friend? Am I using the kind of language that I would use with my best friend? And that takes off some of that ickiness. And Andrea, I've seen some of the stuff that you've posted on social media. 
fair cl um, for clarity there. Andrea is one of my students too. But I've seen what you post on social media and that is exactly what you need to be posting and sending to your email subscribers too. So um, Phyllis says, can a FASA website, oops, it flipped up on me so fast. Can a FASA website only have one or two images of the email? That's the email, Phyllis, it's the email. You can have as many images on your website as you want. So the website is all yours. Um, one of the reasons that I advocate for our website over say something like Etsy or Saatchi is that you own your website. Even if you have it on something like FASO, you own your domain, you own your website. If FASO closed tomorrow, you could hire somebody to move your website to another hosting platform and you'd be fine. If you're on Etsy, and Etsy suddenly changes its terms of service and decides that what you do doesn't work for them anymore, you're out of luck because you don't own that platform. So it's super important to have a platform that you own so that you can reach out from there to your, your audience. So yeah, um, the vulnerability is what Andrea says gets hurt. Yeah, when you're, you're online, you become vulnerable in the sense that you're sharing. That goes back to that, I might look ridiculous thing. Well, I'm here to tell you, you're gonna look ridiculous at one time or another. And you're gonna make a big old giant mess at one time or another. One of the big giant messes I made one time, and some of y'all may have been on that webinar too, the very first webinar I did, back in 2014. I had just gotten the software and I tested it out and thought I knew how it worked, but apparently I didn't have it all down. So I had a couple of hundred people sign up for a webinar. Everybody's logging on. I'm in, I'm looking and going, hot dog, people showed up. This is going to be cool. And I pressed the button that I think is the button to start the webinar and I pressed the wrong button and I just shut the whole thing down. I turned it off and there's no way to turn it back on. Epic fail. And I'm getting emails from people going, where'd you go? The webinar stopped. I had to record it and send it out as a recording. So you figure out a way, everything is figure outable. So think of it as a project and get over that fear of failure because the vulnerability really comes from that fear of failure. The fear you're going to look silly, ridiculous, stupid, or odd as you step out there. You will at some point. So just be willing to throw a leg over. And I know that means something different in other cultures. I forgot that before I started pop popping that one out of my mouth. One of my favorite stories is about me learning how to ride bareback again as an adult after riding bareback as a child and having this real fear of getting off the fence onto my horse. And having to work myself up to do it and to throw my leg over to get on to him. And he got so tired of waiting for me, he inched away from the fence rail. And so it got to be a further distance to throw my leg over. And I was looking around, I was in a workshop and I was just sure everybody was watching me. There was an audience that was watching the workshop. And I was afraid of looking stupid in front of all those people. And I was afraid of hurting myself if I fell. But then I looked down and there's a lot of sand. It was a dressage arena. So it was really heavy sand. Realized if I fell, I'm just going to fall in the sand. It won't hurt. And I can't just sit on the fence forever. I either get on the horse or I get off the fence. And I threw a leg over. And I fell flat on my behind. Because I threw it over with so much force that I went all the way over the other side of the horse and fell in the dirt. And nobody laughed because everybody else was way too worried about how they were going to look as they threw a leg over and nobody paid any attention at all. So I was able to pick myself up, get back on the fence again and bring my long suffering horse back up to the fence and actually get on and stay on. You just have to be willing to fall in the dirt a few times. And if you aren't, you will never get off that fence. So the only way, to make progress is to get out of your comfort zone, to step out and throw that leg over. Um, somebody's saying, how do you keep people from taking advantage who are not really a buyer? Ah, oh, the more you do it, the more you get kind of a sixth sense. And it, there's a, a pattern to some of those 
my wife saw your work on the website thing, stories and emails that you get. Um, I have never lost an artwork to somebody who was a phony buyer, but I don't ever take those cashier's checks and strange wire transfer things either. So I work with a very um, credible um, payment gateway like PayPal or Stripe. And if somebody does a fast one, they take care of that. But I have never had that happen. So uh, you don't really have to worry about that as much as most people think. That's really not an issue. Mary Beth says, is Saatchi a good venue? It might be a good side venue. It's not your main platform because you don't own that platform. Um, if you go to something like Saatchi and somebody else was asking about Wix, um, the trouble with those is that they can change their business model overnight and you're out of luck. I would use those as a, a kind of parallel secondary platform, but they should never be your primary platform. The problem with Wix, Wix, you theoretically are having your own platform, but Wix and Weebly in particular, I have big bones to pick with. They are not good platforms for hosting your website. And here's why. You can't move it from there easily. They lock you in and you can't export your website. So if you decide to upgrade and go to a better platform host, it's really, really, really hard to leave Weebly or Wix. And you don't want a web address that says myname.wix.com or myname.wordpress.com. You need your own domain name. It's a professional thing. It's like you know, joining the big, the big girls club. You don't want to have the, the freebie website because that just screams I'm not professional. I know people who do it, but set yourself up for, from success, for success from the get-go. Avoid those things. Yes, exactly, Sue McFadden. You know what I'm talking about because I've preached that so much. Tell them a story in your emails. Give them something. Susan says, I am wondering how I got your notice of this seminar, which is the next right thing I needed to know. I'm so glad. That's excellent. Well, if you're on my email list, then you got a notice. If you are on, in the free Artwork Living Facebook group, I have put up notices about that. And I also had ads running. You may have found it that way too. But I, either way, I'm really glad that you're here. That's awesome. So let me make sure that I'm covering all the things that I said I was going to cover because I'm really good going down rabbit holes. So I've talked about how building an online platform can help you reach more people and have more impact. It's really hard nowadays to have an impact without that online platform. And there are lots of other artists out there who've created an impact from their online platforms and pursuing different kinds of success paths. So I wanna again emphasize that everybody's not cut out of the same pattern. We all have different directions that we need to go. And by success paths, I mean the, the direction, the goal, the direction that you're gonna take to reach your success goal. So if your idea of success is having a museum exhibition, then there are ways to use your platform to get there. If your idea of success is to have, um, be represented in a gallery, a physical gallery, there are ways to get there. If it's selling online, there are ways to get there. If it's writing grant proposals or Kickstarter projects to fund your project like Kirsten did, then there are ways to get there. So all of them pivot off of this foundation of having your own, that you, you literally own, your own platform, your website, your email list. The part you don't entirely own is your social media account because Facebook could go away like MySpace. Remember MySpace? like MySpace did. Um, Twitter can go away, any of those can go away. But as long as you've got those other two components, then you're gonna be in good shape. You just don't wanna be dependent on any single thing. 
Um, Mary Beth asks, is Saatchi a good venue? Um, I think I'm, or did I read that one already? Saatchi is one that somebody else owns. So again, it's the secondary one, not the primary one. Um, Jane, or Janice said something about the business side. Okay, Janice says, are you gonna talk about the business of art more? I'm scared of making a mistake with payments and taxes. I have a business PayPal account and credit card reader, but I've never used it. I'm scared of using it, especially online payments. I have a business bank account attached to it and tried to attach PayPal to FASA, but found it really confusing. I have a Facebook business page, but it got confused with that. So much to think about beyond making time to paint and prepare art for selling. We go into that a lot in my online course that's coming up in Painter's Path. Yeah, about the actual nuts and bolts of doing those things. So I'm not going to talk too much about like how to connect the PayPal accounts during the, the um, Thriving Artist Workshop. But I'll tell you right now that if you've got a FASO website, all you need to do is to call support because they'll walk you through it. Their support is beyond anything I've seen from, from other platforms like that. So if you email or call their support team, they will help you link up that PayPal account. One of the reasons I do not go into taxes is that I teach internationally. So I have students from around the world, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, Mexico, France, UK, Ireland, Germany, South Africa, and that may be it. And there's no way I can cover all of those different tax systems with any kind of depth. So the best way to find out tax information for your own individual location is to contact your local tax commission. Because often, if you're, for example, if you're in the US, the state tax commission has a website that has information for new business owners that will give you an idea of what you need to do. You generally do need a retail license. If you're selling online, you need a business license. And there are other requirements that are entirely dependent on where you are. So you're right to be concerned about that, but don't let it stop you. It's not as complicated as it sounds. So most governments really want to help empower small businesses. And as artists, we're small businesses. Even if you're not trying to make a big profit, you're a small business. So you can contact the um, sm whatever small business resources are available and they'll help, help you set up the legalities of it. Because like I said, that's gonna be completely dependent on where you are. PayPal has resources on that as well, as does FASO. So on the, the big end of it. But um, yeah, you do need, if you, whatever social media platform you're going to use, you need a business account on that one. So Facebook, for example, doesn't like people to conduct business on personal pages. And they're kind of okay with the, the talking about your artwork on there, but it, they don't like you to mention money on your personal page. They can shut your whole account down if you do that. But you can mention money on your business page. And if you're gonna run advertising through Facebook and Instagram, you have to have a business account in order to do it. So I definitely talk about opening up whatever platform you've chosen to use. Open a business account on those platforms in order to go forward. It's super important. So, um, Kat, Kata. Am I pronouncing your right, name right, Kathy Keita? Says, are you familiar with Daily Paintworks? I sure am, I'm on Daily Paintworks. And I consider it some of the best advertising return on spend that's out there. It's about $12.95, I think, a month. And it is pure advertising. Um, you don't sell necessarily a tremendous amount on that, 
but I have had a lot of collectors come to my website from Daily Paintworks. So I think of it as a, a platform that I move people from there to my website and to my email list. I've had people, lots of people buy from there who come to my website. So it's a good one. Um, they do have sort of a stripped down version of the FASO websites on Daily Paintworks that you can set up and it's fine to do that. I just don't think that they have as many um, bells and whistles attached to it for the amount of money that you're putting in. So while I think it's great from the advertising standpoint, it, I don't think it's the best place to set up your platform. So it can work, but it's not the best one. Um, Christine says, I have the cart before the horse system syndrome. I just don't feel competitive. Ooh, I love that comment. And here's why. Because the only person you're competing with is you. There is so much less competition out there as a result of how far the reach is on the internet that a lot of that old backstabbing competitiveness that you find in smaller art communities just disappears. So it is not as big an issue. Um, <coughs> the thing to remember is that you're not trying to get all of the collectors on the internet. You're trying to get the collectors who are in your narrow niche. So for example, with me, I paint, my current work revolves primarily around contemporary landscape. And so my niche of collectors are the ones that are interested in landscape or see landscape as a connection to environment, to place, to memory, to time, to an experience of light and color. People who are looking for artwork about animals are probably not going to buy my paintings. So, I'm not competing with the people over there doing that. I have a colleague, and I'm not going to name names, but that some of y'all might know and may even have studied with, who I think the world of. She makes awesome paintings of flowers. And while I have painted flowers in the past, it's not what I'm doing right now. And if she's out there selling her flower paintings, it just gets me excited because I know there's a market out there that's buying art. So her selling artwork is not hurting my market at all. In fact, it's just growing it. So don't worry about um, not feeling competitive because you don't even have to be competitive. What you need to be is confident. So eliminate competitiveness, because I think that actually hurts more than it helps. Instead, know that there is, there's an audience out there for everybody. And that's what that platform gives us, is the ability to reach our little group of raving fans. And we're not competing with our neighbor or the neighbor over there or the neighbor over here. There's space for all of us. So if you see somebody else doing really well on the internet, cheer them on because they're carving a path forward for all the rest of us. So don't, don't worry about that part at all. I think we bring each other along together and we do a whole lot better. Instead, look for ways to have partnerships with other people instead of feeling competitive with them. So I don't think you're putting the cart before the horse there at all. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that. That's a great one. Um, Susan says, what about LinkedIn? Yeah. Um, LinkedIn is an underrated social platform. I have friends that their entire focus is on LinkedIn and it's not just for business people. We tend to think of it as being a place for bankers and lawyers but there are artists doing just fine on LinkedIn. So if you love LinkedIn, that's your platform. So the message I want to send there about social media is don't feel like you have to learn a new one. Which one are you already active on? That's the one you need to focus on for your platform building. Don't try to learn something new. Start with the one that you already know. And don't feel like you have to make it huge and overwhelming. 
keep it small. In fact, I, ha I have a phrase I've started using. Everybody's heard of KISS, but I have a little bit different way of saying it. Keep it stupidly simple. I'm one of those people who tends to overcomplicate things, and I have to keep telling myself that three to four times a day. Keep it stupidly simple. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it works. I would just pick the one, Susan, that you feel really, really comfortable with already. So I'm going to try to scroll back up here and grab a couple of other questions in just a second. Um, just to make sure I don't, ooh, I don't miss anything. Oh, I love this. Amy Dean says, I'm the corporate artist and product specialist for an international art supply company and still hear that crap from people. And I get paid a salary for being an artist. When I discuss leaving and working from my own studio, everybody says, don't do it. Yeah, I know. And the thing is that you absolutely can do it. You can take the same things that you're doing in your job there and apply it to your own business. Um, I definitely got that stuff when I left academia. So I had an academic job for over 25 years. I taught at the college level. I was a full professor when I left at a small women's college in South Carolina. So I'd gone all the way up through the academic ranks. In fact, there wasn't anywhere further for me to go there. I'd maxed out my promotion love options there. And when I left, people told me I was crazy because I was giving up tenure and a supposedly secure job in order to go off and work for myself. But the truth is the only security you really have is when you work for yourself. When you're working for somebody else, the, the, what you don't see is what's going on behind the curtain. You don't know how secure that job position is, and it could evaporate overnight. But when you're working for yourself, you know that you can have confidence in yourself, that you're going to do what it takes to keep going and to create that thriving business. So let me see the last ones on here. Um, excellent. Mariana, thank you, Carson, says, our art fairs a waste of time and money? A few people liked it. And okay. Um, art fairs. Ooh, I have some mixed feelings about art fairs. Um, art fairs as venues are to a degree going the way of malls and shopping centers. So, you know, the indoor mall used to be all of that and people loved going there. And attendance at indoor malls has dropped precipitously in the last 10 years, and a lot of them are closing. A lot of the same thing has happened to art fairs, that they don't have the attendance that they used to have and the sales that they used to have. And if you think about it, the same thing has, disrupt, has disrupted them as has disrupted indoor malls, online buying. Most people prefer to shop online. They don't have to go out in the heat. They don't have to get in the car and drive. And they can shop from a whole wide array. So the, the retail venues that are doing well are the ones that are small and artisanal. They're one of a kind. So the, the latest generation out there shops still locally but they shop in one of a kind stores where they can stroll from store to store in an outdoor, more village-like atmosphere. So the patterns of buying have shifted. So I think one of the positives of doing art fairs is that you get a chance to talk to people face to face and understand the questions that they have about your art. You have a chance to build your email list. And depending on which art fair you are participating in, you have a chance to make some sales, but the sales can be hit or miss. You need to make sure you've got a wide range of price points and you need to make sure that that art fair has a history of people making money there. Ask them what the sales were like the previous year. Don't just randomly sign up for one. So 
I want everybody to remember there will be a replay recording of this that will be going out to those who registered for it and for those who are over in the Facebook group it will be in there as a replay as well. And I want to leave you with one thought, and that is that it's all well and good to develop that platform, but it's not going to do anything for you until you get the system going to build that audience, to putting the social media hub and the email list to work to move people from out there to in here. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow is audience building. Because the audience building and having control over that audience building is what sets us free now as artists and really in, enables us to thrive. There's a writer who came up with the idea, the theory that all you need to survive as a creative or as any kind of entrepreneur is a thousand dedicated raving fans not just a thousand followers but a thousand raving fans that's the audience that you want to develop that's how you want to put your online platform to work to develop that audience so be sure to tune in tomorrow or at least watch that replay, but you know you'll get more out of it live and hope to see you there. So fantastic for all of y'all to show up. Hey, Nikki, one of my students from the college. Awesome. And hey, Ree James, it's good to see you. So I'm going to take the last few minutes here and scroll back to see if I can catch some of those questions that we've already missed and give everybody another maybe 10 minutes of questions before I sign off. Um, oh, I'm not sure that I'm reading the name here right, but Desley Roth is what the signed in. Says, I'm 61, had a reasonably successful career several years ago, then became sick with a chronic illness, but I did my master's degree. I almost feel like I'm starting over again and the art market sales seem to have dropped. Things changed probably in those in-between years so that the platform needs are a little bit different. The actual mechanics of creating an audience and selling haven't changed, you know, having an audience and selling, but the mechanisms that you use to get there are a little bit different. So all you need is a tune-up there. So if you've had an audience before, you can get an audience again. And it is to a degree starting over, but you're starting with different techniques and ones that strategies that are so much easier to implement than they were even five years ago. I totally agree, Ginger Box. Make art, not excuses. Totally agree. Love that one. And Denise says, Oh my God, I live in the middle of a forest, far from town, not the center of the art world. Yeah, I remember when they used to tell you that you had to go to New York if you wanted to make it. And I sure bought into that. And I went to New York after I finished grad school the first time. And I starved, literally. I was a starving artist in New York. I got super, super skinny because I just didn't have any money. That was pre-internet days. And there's no need to do that anymore. New York is not the center of the art world anymore. The, your middle of the forest can be the center of your art world. Because one of the things that the internet enables us to do through creating our own online platform is we create our own small ecosystem, our own small art world. And it can be anywhere that we want. It can be like one of my favorite places on the beach painting. I can do 99.99% .99 of the work that I do from the Savannah Wildlife Refuge, from Tybee Island Beach, from Edisto Island, from the mountains of North Carolina, anywhere I want to go. It doesn't matter where you are. That can be where your art world is centered. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, thank you, Gretchen. Yeah, Gretchen is already in the painter's path, and I am so glad to have you in there. You have really dived right down into it deeply. Dessa Roth says, I get fatigued, so I tend to paint more smaller works. That's perfect. So one of the models that works super well is daily painting, and it doesn't really even have to be daily. It can be every other day. It can be three times a week. And the daily painting model is the one that I used when I got started online. It works gangbusters and people love being able to buy smaller works. You're filling a niche when you do that. When people are able to buy a smaller painting, it gets them hooked on owning original art. And then they become more likely to collect larger works later or just build a fantastic collection of smaller works. So that is totally a way that you can create a successful business. Susie says, some of us stink at telling a good story. Um, now, I will fully admit that I think being Southern is a serious advantage on the storytelling front because we are a people who love a good story. And we learn how to tell stories from the time we're really small. But I truly haven't met anybody who's totally devoid of the ability to tell a story. And I think part of what holds people back is the, the idea that the story has to be a novel. And that certainly freaked me out in the beginning. I thought when I tell a story, it has to be the next best novel out of the South. And it doesn't. It doesn't at all. It just needs to be authentic and it needs to be you and it needs to be told in vernacular conversational tones. So all of us can do it. If you are able to go out in a group of five friends and have a conversation, you can tell a story. So it is absolutely possible. Joe, I love that comment. Joe Murphy says, I've never looked at an artwork and wondered how the artist is qualified. I don't think people do that either. People don't look at a painting and fall in love with it and then decide not to buy it because the person doesn't have a degree or that they are, um, they did their own personal MFA, that they went and studied with individual people. People are looking for artwork that they connect with, that hits them emotionally. People buy because of emotions and then they justify their purchase with logic. So. The degree doesn't matter at all. Susan says, do larger works sell better? It depends on your niche. So the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on who you decide you want to connect with. I would never paint to the, what you perceive the market to be if that's not where your curiosity lies. So don't go make big paintings because you think big paintings will sell better. Make the paintings that you want to make and share those with an audience that shares the same interests and you'll be fine. Um, going back to that Messenger question, Messenger is a Facebook platform and you can create a list in Messenger. The problem with thinking about that as being totally independent is that it still depends on, on Facebook and not everybody is on there. But that is a form of kind of an email list. It's just more like, across between Twitter and email. So to do that right, you want to think about it as little individual tweets or text messages that you're, you're automating. It's a little complicated. Susie says, can you sell on Instagram? Oh my word, yes you can. I have and my students have. So you absolutely can sell directly off of Instagram by asking somebody if they're interested in it to send you a private message on Instagram. So showing your work on social media directly to potential collectors absolutely does work. There are systems that you can use and put in place to make it work. Simply posting on Instagram doesn't work by itself. So let me back up for a minute there. I have a friend online who's an extraordinary painter. I think the world of his work, it is truly stellar. And one of the, the, I want to own one of his paintings at some point because they take me to a place 
that makes me feel that landscape. That's what I was talking about, compelling artwork. So I really love his work, but he has no clue about social media. And when he started working on Instagram, he asked, does this work? And I said, yeah, it absolutely does. I sell via Instagram pretty regularly. And he, so he started his account, but all he does is post the, the painting. There's no caption. There is, there's no writing. Every now and then he'll tell you a title or where it was with like two words, but there's no engagement. There's no conversation. There's no relationship being built. And social media is social. You've got to be social. So it's like going to the cocktail parties. And I like to use that analogy. So social media are the cocktail parties where you go out and meet people. You mix and mingle. It's a little easier for those of us who are introverted because we can have the computer screen and the keyboard in between us. Your email list is more like the invitations you send out for dinner parties at your house. And your house is your website. So the social media platform is very public and your website is a little bit more private. Your emails are even more private. They're private letters. Um, oh, Jane Wright says following you means what? Um, when you talk about followers on social media, on both Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, any of those, people have the option to follow what you post. And that's actually what they're called on Instagram. And so if people like your page on Facebook, your business page, they're your followers. And you don't want them to just stay followers who are following your social media. You want to move them to become fans and subscribe to your email list and later become collectors through buying your artwork. So that's what I mean. Um, Denise says, I've done two local art shows. The attendees love my work, but no sales. I am a big believer in the fact that you really need to use the internet as the main hub for your art sales and not depend entirely on local art sales and local art fairs. Because when you focus on the local, your market is extraordinarily narrow and limited. And it's going to be limited to people who share those same interests and have the economic means in order to pay for the work. When you go global with an online platform, the odds of finding people who cross over and are both um, fantastically interested in your work and have the ability to buy it goes up a whole lot. So the odds of selling it goes up when you're online. So be careful with depending on local. Local should only be one part of the, the tripod that you're building. Um, yeah, Anne says, I just heard an approach to fundraisers asking you to donate a piece. Ask them to buy it and then they can auction it. That way they're supporting the artist and their cause because artists can't deduct it on their taxes that never works because they are not going to buy the piece and then auction it. So it, you can say that, but I honestly think that it's, you're spitting into the wind to try and convince those people that it's not to your benefit to participate that way and to try to retrain them. What works better, what I do instead is to tell them that I only donate to three causes a year and that I have, and I usually pick those at the beginning of the year in January. And if it's June, I've already made my choices for the year and I've probably already made all the donations I'm going to make. And that my business manager just does not allow me to do more than that. And Stephanie can be over there chuckling right now because she is my, basically my online business manager. I said that even before I had anybody working for me because I don't allow myself to do that. I only pick three and they have to be causes that I feel really, really strongly about. So 
don't try to change their minds. I've been down that road and argued to my, I'm blue in the face and it's just really frustrating. So, um, we'll talk a little more about the text stuff tomorrow as we talk about audience building. I think I've hit most of these points. Um, the software that I use to create my email list, Francois, is um, the one I started out with, the one that I advise people to start out with because of its ease of use and flexibility is MailChimp. And MailChimp has this little monkey that's their mascot that high fives you when you send out an email campaign. Another reason I recommend MailChimp is because it's free for your first 2,000 subscribers which usually fits into the budget of most artists when they're starting their online platforms. So MailChimp is the way to go. Um, I am laughing at you, Susan McFadden. <laughs> I did see you stick out your tongue. Um, MJ says, doesn't FASO also give you an email address? It does. It um, FASO will, once you have a domain name with them, you can set up your email through FASO as well. So they are basically a one-stop shop that will take care of you. They have really good support there too. Um, I think I've caught most of these. Excellent. Oh, there's some more new ones coming in. Let me double check there. Then I'm going to let people go. Um, Oh, Susan, cool. You've got your website up. Awesome. Awesome. So you just need to get that audience going. Terry says, my daughter told me young people do not have the time to go shopping, but they do get on the internet from their couch. Absolutely they do. And that's what's killing malls is people, young people. My daughter is at that. She's on the tail end of the millennials or the upper end of the millennials. So in her generation, um, they have a different buying pattern. They buy the things that matter to them. They're buying experiences. They buy based on emotions and they do it very consciously and they do it from their couch. Absolutely. So they are quite happy living in a smaller house in order to be able to live in the neighborhood, in the city that they want to live in which is great for artists because it means that that generation is willing to buy art. So there's a whole new art market coming up that is quite happy to spend money on art. They see the value of it. So that's a good thing. Um, oh, excellent. Somebody's got another gallery. I love it when people get into galleries. I don't know. Andrea, are you still on over there in Facebook? Andrea um, got her second gallery, I think two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. How big a body of work do you need? Um, you need to have, in general, that hasn't changed that much. You need a consistent body of work, work that hangs together, you know, that looks like it was made by the same person which means don't do three photographs, five sculptures, and two or three paintings, and then put it out. That's not enough of a connection. They need to relate in some way. And 10 to 12 is enough to get started. So you don't need a huge amount, but you wanna make the best work that you can make, and you want them to be compelling. So don't wait until you've got perfect artwork. Get it out there and get feedback from your market. Be willing to post artwork that you're not sure about and ask people for questions. So um, Nancy says, how do I access the painter's path? We're going to open it up on the day of our last video, which is next Monday. So you can access the painter's path starting next Monday. It'll open as we wrap up our third workshop. So it's coming. It's just not open yet. We have to get it all ready to go for everybody to, to join in. So yes, Jean, we have another session tomorrow. So this is a three-part workshop. 
Today we're focusing on building your online platform and why that is so important. And I hope I haven't run that into the ground. Tomorrow we're talking about the importance of audience. So remember the building the online platform is just the first step. You have the platform, but now you got to get the peoples. You got to build that community. So that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Then on Monday, that's our third video because everybody has to have the weekend off. On Monday, we're going to be talking about taking that audience and creating an offer that fits them like a glove and how to move them from follower and fan to collector. So we're going through that whole sequence from platform to audience to offer to the thing you're going to sell and how you get it out there. So yes, it's a three part training. Um, Karen, yes, I use YouTube. YouTube is fantastic. Um, you have to be careful when you're using YouTube so that you know that you're targeting your market. So if you are setting yourself up to teach online or teach workshops, teach people how to paint, then doing demonstrations on YouTube about how to paint works gangbusters. But doing demos on YouTube about how to use a number eight brush or a filbert it's not gonna get you a collector. So you gotta be sure that, that those things are in alignment. But yes, it works really, really, really well. Yes, MailChimp for the win. And let me cruise over here to Facebook and see if I'm missing anything. Mariana says, um, I hate online shopping. I'm do, going to do a small art fair. Yeah, I think that you need to figure out which venue works for you. Um, and also understand that your customer is not you. So while you may hate shopping online, your ideal client or customer, who's like my daughter and like some of the others that people were talking about, loves to shop online. Doesn't mean you can't reach them, it just means you don't like to shop online. So one of the big mistakes I see people make is to equate themselves and their own likes and dislikes with the potential target market that they're after. So make sure you don't do that. Oh, my phone just died. So let me see if I can scroll through here. Um, Carson, let me know if you see any other questions because as usual, Facebook is not letting me, oops, I know I can get it. I've got my iPad here, I've got my backup system. Let me see if I can plug one of these devices in so I can see the comments from over there in Facebook. Nothing like having it die right in midstream. So batteries for everything else but that. Um, get that open. And head over there. Um, Oh, you are most welcome, Robin and Avril and Sandra and Melanie. Awesome. Melanie C is in the house. So Melanie went to paint camp with us and she is in composition, color and light right now. So it's good to see her here. And of course, my phone is not going to come back up quickly and neither is the rest of my internet stuff. So um, the only one I missed was about hashtags. Cool. Um, hashtags, excellent. Hashtags are things that you use on Instagram, and we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. It's one of the ways to find your target audience, but hashtags are incredibly useful on Instagram, incredibly unuseful on Facebook. So each platform's really, really different, and you have to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing is specific to that platform. Um, Andrea says, I feel like posting and tech stuff totally takes me out of my flow and then I lose my feeling of being present. I get so frustrated I can't shift gears back and forth. And I totally get that, Andrea. And one of the things that you have to do, we were talking about this last night in the coaching program, that you have to calendar it what you're running into is that you're splitting your focus. When we're painting, we need to be in flow. 
and multitasking doesn't work while we're painting. So I would figure out when your most productive time is to paint and calendar that. And when your most productive time to be online is and calendar that and make them really separate so that you have a specific time to paint and a specific time to do the business part of it. And you need to allocate roughly 50-50 for that to start out with in order to get results. You can't do it for 10% but trying to grab it in little tiny moments while you're in the studio will absolutely drive you crazy. Don't do that for sure. Um, thank you, Carson. Um, Gail says, how do we get the free ebook I mentioned earlier? Great question. It's going to come in your email inbox as along with the link to the replay recording. So everybody who's registered and showed up today is going to get their ebook and courtesy of Carson who put it together for me is going to get their ebook later this evening. Once we get that replay recording up and that email headed towards your email inbox. So look for that this evening and keep your eyes peeled for that. I'll also give you a reminder about what we're going to be covering in the next two sessions. So awesome. Thank y'all for being here today. Excellent. Um, Catherine says, I have a WordPress website up and coming. Should I use their email service? Now, I think you must be talking about WordPress.com and not WordPress.org. WordPress.org is the individual WordPress website that goes on your own private hosting, and it does not come with an email service provider. WordPress.com, I think now has that option. I have not used them, and I think probably what they've got is going to be relatively limited, so I would be hesitant to recommend it. I would use MailChimp instead. And make sure if you're using WordPress.com, that you use your own domain name. So it's a great place to get started. And one of the things I like about WordPress.com is when you're ready to switch to your own independent one, it's super easy to move your website. So that's a great place to start. So awesome. Thank you all for joining us. And I look forward to talking with you soon. Happy painting, everybody. And Come on back tomorrow where we're going to be talking about building that engaged audience and what that can do for you in creating your online platform. Bye-bye for now.